Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Conversations Over Coffee with me, Rabbi Steve Wernick. Today, I am delighted to welcome Jay Solomon to the conversation. I look forward to speaking with him about Jewish life on college campuses throughout Ontario. In particular, we want to talk about anti-Semitism on campus. But before we get to that, we're on Facebook, YouTube, and betsedic.tv. If you like today's conversation, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Comments are always appreciated and they help us get the conversation to more people. If you have any questions, please put them in the Facebook or YouTube chat and we'll do our best to bring them into the show. With that out of the way, allow me to introduce our guests. Jay Solomon is a seasoned Jewish community leader with significant expertise in stakeholder cultivation and management, communications, public affairs, strategic planning, corporate governance, and professional coaching. He currently serves as the Chief Communications and Public Affairs Officer for Hillel Ontario, which is the largest Hillel in the world. Uh, please welcome Jay Solomon to our conversation. Hi there. How are Hi, you? Jay. You know, as we begin, I, I want to again express to you and to your family condolences on the loss of your grandmother, uh, Helen uh, Chapman, uh, Chapnick. Um, you know, uh, I, I didn't get to know her, but uh, was involved in her funeral last week. Um, and she just lived a, a remarkable, long, uh, lovely life. And uh, we hope that your memories of her continue to inspire you. Thank you so much. Um, let, let's jump right in. And before we get to the hot topic, uh, Hillel, Ontario is the largest Hillel in the world. Uh, now, one of the reasons for that is because it's a uh, it's an umbrella Hillel for um, some of the major universities here in Ontario. Tell us a little bit about how that works and about Jewish life on campus here in Ontario. Well, thank you. And first of all, great to great to be here and great to talk to you and 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 to be with the Bethsaida community. Uh, I really appreciate the the opportunity. Hill Ontario, we say, is the largest regional hill in the world because, as you said, it's this umbrella organization uh, that that works to support Jewish life across nine universities in the province uh, at, at the moment. And of course, some of those universities have multiple campuses. So, U University of Toronto, as an example, would have the St. George campus in addition to the Mississauga campus and the Scarborough campus. And, and so some of those, um, some of the other universities that we deal with also have uh, multiple campuses. So we say that we are working to empower roughly 14,000 Jewish students uh, on university campuses across the province. Now the best kept secret, or perhaps the worst kept secret in the community is that Hillel Ottawa is currently not part of the Hillel Ontario umbrella. Uh, so we say the schools other than, other than those in our nation's capital, um, there are also some schools that are currently not staffed, um, which, which we are obviously trying to support in the best way that we can. Uh, but we have full-time professional teams uh, scattered across these nine universities in the province. And, you know, that really makes Hillel um, unique in a certain sense, that we have uh, Jewish professionals who are on the ground embedded with, with Jewish students day to day, 365 days a year, um, engaging with them, learning with them, teaching them, uh, empowering them. Uh, and as we start to talk about anti-Semitism, you know, dur during this show, you know, it is, it is so key to be able to have the relationships that we do to be able to cultivate them. You know, I often talk about this sort of a pyramid approach, right? At the very bottom, we try and get the, the broadest, the, the, the most number of Jewish students that we can. And then we slowly, slowly, slowly cultivate them into the top of the pyramid. Um, and, and, and as you do that, you, you really create the next generation of Jewish community leaders. And that's really what we're doing at Hello. So uh, what are some of the trends that you're seeing amongst young people in terms of their, their interests, their engagement, the um, areas where they're journeying and seeking, um, the areas where they're not? Yeah. Um, what, what, what's the tachlis? of the work that you're doing in terms of engaging young people on the college campus? We are really trying to, you know, and this, and this sounds, sounds vague, but we are trying to meet them where they are. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think as a community, uh, we are all learning, whether it be synagogues or, or Jewish community institutions like, like ours, 
we know that this generation and the, and the generation that is sort of coming up now is different than the previous generations. And there's so many reasons why, uh, you know, even look at the last two years living through the pandemic and, and how that has shaped and changed the next generation of Jews. You know, a, a crazy ex illustration, you know, we were looking at, at birthright and how we um, how we support the birthright process. Right now, Hill Ontario has got 12 buses of 350 roughly uh, Jewish students going on birthright this summer. And we were looking for leaders. And so we asked some of our staff, you know, our young zillennial staff and said, can you lead a trip? Would you be? And they said, we can't. And we said, why? We haven't been to Israel yet. Because the past two years through these lockdowns uh, and, and the challenges of the pandemic, we are, we are seeing a dramatic sort of change in the makeup of, of, of Jewish students and, and, and Jewish young adults. So, you know, all of this to say is we really need to sort of look at our, look at our baseline and say, okay, where are the students? What are they interested in? Um, what are the things they're passionate about? What are the things they're not passionate about? Uh, and then how do we go out and sort of create these micro communities? You know, we've got some students who, who are super interested in you know, when they go away to university, they're missing the sort of Shabbat dinner, the chicken soup type stuff that, you know, they're, you talked about my grandmother, you know, you, you, I went to my grandmother's and grandfather's house every Shabbat as a kid. And so, you know, there's a lot of students who come to university and are missing that. And so we try and, we try and connect with them through, through Shabbat, through the holidays. Uh, there are some students who who are all about Hasbara and all about um, wanting to do Israel in some way, and and so we we connect with them there. There are others who are very interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion spaces, and and finding ways to connect the Jewish uh, campus community to the broader campus community. Uh, that's a huge area for us right now in terms of in terms of DEI and how. Um, you know, maybe it's a nice segue into anti-Semitism. You know, you look at the Jewish students and you look at the Jewish community. We're the most frequently targeted religious minority for hate crimes in the country. But on a university campus, when you talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, the voices of the Jewish community are non-existent or almost non-existent. And so we have a lot of students who, who are really interested in sort of bridging that gap and finding ways of getting involved um, through, through a diversity lens, but to bring Jewish voices as a marginalized community to come to some of these spaces. Um, so we're just looking, we're, we're just looking for any hook that we that, that we can identify. Um, and really, it's student driven, right? The students are the ones who are saying this is what's important to me. And then we're saying, okay, how can we support them? Um, I, I want to just ask a, another question related to that before we get into the hot topic. Um, and that is, from what you're seeing through the college uh, through the university years um, what what's the advice that you would have for synagogues and other legacy institutions in terms of how they should be um, looking to meet the students where they are um, and and to help them in that next in that next stage of their uh, growth and development or or is it just that the the, the field is such that until they get married and start having children, they're just not thinking about, about that space. Wow, I mean, if I could answer that question. Um, I was hoping you could, Jay, come on. <laughs> you know, I'll t I'll, so I'll, t I'll tell you a couple of things. You know, first I'll say from, from a Hillel perspective, um, we wanna partner with you. We wanna partner with synagogue. We, you know, we, we want to be involved uh, in, in making sure that the young people that we are dealing with stay connected to community, because I really believe that, and the data backs it up, you know, Hill International did a, did a study recently where it looked at, um, you know, exactly this question, you know, Jewish students and students that are involved in Hillel and where they go. And, you know, the data shows that, that, that these students are very much the next generation, right? These are the leaders of the future. Um, you know, they're more likely to have, if you're involved in Hillel, you're more likely to have Shabbat dinners. You're more likely to, to view Israel as a, as a key component of your identity. You're more likely to take an active role in your own community as you grow up. Uh, so we wanna partner with you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say personally, I think that, I think that we are all struggling. Um, uh, as people who work in this field with, with ways of, I, of, of grabbing, you know, even people my own age, right? Um, sort of past the university um, 
demographic, you know, young fam people with young families, you know, how do we, how do we uh, continue to tie my generation to this community? And I, you know, I think, I think it comes back to what I said earlier, you know, we need to, we need to identify and it's, and it's unique to the person or unique to the group. Like what is it that is that, 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 that person is passionate about, um, you know, outside of work, I'm passionate about my, my kids, Jewish day school and, you know, wanting to, wanting to make sure that they have a Jewish education. Um, I went to public school. So for me, you know, this is an opportunity for something that I'm personally interested in. Uh, and so I think, I think that it comes down to that, uh, you know, let's work together to, to figure it out. Um, thanks for that. Uh, let's turn now to anti-Semitism on campus. Um, as you said uh, previously, that the Jewish community is the most targeted community for hate crimes in Canada and in the United States and North America and really around the world. Uh, we've seen in the last five years uh, the, the increase of, of anti-Semitism and hate crimes against the Jewish community has grown exponentially. And the gap between the Jewish community and then the next, uh, the next minority uh, disenfranchised community that suffers from hate crime, at least from what's reported from the police is the black community. Um, uh, but there's like 30 percentage points between the, the two of them. So, I mean, even if you're, even if there's an underreporting of the black community in terms of hate crime, which is likely, um, it's, it's also not probable that it would equal what is happening to the Jewish community. Um, and it also seems, by way of introduction, it seems that that is even more so on, on the campus. Uh, and um, from what I understand, a lot of the anti-Israel, anti-Semitism that's happening on the college campus, unfortunately, even has its origins here in Canada at, at York University, for example. Can you give us some context about what's happening on, uh, on campus with regard to anti-Semitism in Ontario? Yeah, sure. So I've been working, um, I've been working in this particular field for for, for sure the better part of a decade, close to 13 or 14 years at this point. And I'll tell you all this stuff is cyclical, right? Um, but I think that where we're at today is, is different in the sense of this past summer's war um, really impacted Jewish students and, and, and I would say the Jewish community more broadly in, in, in a way that, um, that, that is, you know, really hits home. You know, I hear from from our staff who are speaking to students all the time, and you know, this recent conflict has really heightened students' sense of of, of anti-Semitism, but in a personal way. You know, it's not this sort of foreign concept that that they know about from reading, they know about from you know, you know, this person said that. No, they they feel it, um, and they they feel it because they're experiencing it in many different circles. You know, they've experienced it maybe on campus. They're seeing it on social media. Uh, you know, one of the constants over the last two years, you know, when you can't see people face to face, you're, you know, you're seeing them through your phone, through your iPad, whatever. Um, the, the amount of anti-Semitism that, that students are seeing online uh, is, is staggering and, and, and disturbing. And, and it's in a way that, you know, many of them have said to us, I feel like I can't get away from it. Uh, you know, when there's a speaker who, who, who comes to campus and, you know, says terrible things about Israel or students can choose not to go to that, right? Uh, when they pick up their phone and scroll Instagram and, and this is what they see over and over and over again, um, they say to us, this really affects us. And so, you know, I, I would say the last year has been extremely, extremely challenging. You know, students feel like they're being threatened and they're being bullied and discriminated against. Um, labeled racist and <laughs> colonialists and, and murderers and, and ultimately being held responsible or they feel like they're being held responsible for the decisions of a government thousands of kilometers away. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, this has really, this has really hit home and is really, is really touching students in a very challenging and very profound way. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why the work that we're doing at Hillel is, is so important to be, to be able to stand with these students and even if we can't fix every problem, because God knows I would love to fix every problem, but we're standing beside them. We are working with them. Um, and, uh, you know, 
that in of itself, you know, in the same way that as a rabbi, you know, you stand, you know, you stood with my family last Friday, right, at, uh, at the cemetery, and, you know, you couldn't fix, you couldn't fix the pain, you couldn't, but you were there, and, and, and I think in a similar way, we're doing that with students as well. Um, but, but, but make no mistake, like, this has been a very challenging time uh, to be a Jewish student. And, and, and it's so, it's so hard and, and multi-layered. I mean, we were talking before we went on air um, that the, uh, you know, the, um, the haters are, are, it's a different game. Right? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say game in that way, but it's like, it's, it, we're, we're not playing on the same field, right? That um, when when we approach these issues, we tend to do so in a nuanced perspective. You know, you, you gave a hint to this, is that Jewish students and Jews are being held accountable for the decisions of a government that's miles away. And when you criticize the policies of that government, that's legitimate. But when you start, um, scooping every Jewish person into the sense that somehow or other they're accountable to the government, that's when it yeah. becomes anti-Semitic. Well, and you also get this dynamic of, of, of sort of the good Jews, right, versus the problematic Jews. Yeah. You know, we often, we often, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, right, where they bring in certain certain elements within our own community to justify some of the things that they're saying about us. Exactly. Uh, and and then the complication between, you know, Israel as a Jewish homeland and, and the message that we as a Jewish community, which is that as a Jewish homeland, as the, you know, Reshitz Michakul Atenu, the beginning of our redemption, as we understand it in theological terms, um, you know, we have a connection. We want to have a connection to Israel. It's an important part of Jewish identity. It's always been a part of an important part of Jewish identity. But the nuance between supporting Israel and disagreeing or having the ability to disagree with policy, which is the same, by the way, as being Canadian and not always agreeing with the policy of whichever government's in power whenever that's the case. Yeah, um, that gets lost in, in the Israel conversation. Um, how, how do you help students? What are the tools that, that they need in order to, one, um, you know, just find their own sense of, of self within that really messy construct? And two, if they choose to, re to respond and to become involved in advocacy and, um, and engagement in terms of the, the debate issues here, um, how, how do you help students through that? I'll tell you, it's interesting because it, it, it's it's sort of a sad reality of, of of our business. But the more our students feel like their backs are up against the wall, the more they come forward and say, "I want to do something." Uh, if if we look at uh, at our data trends from you know let's say two years ago or even last year versus this year, the number of students who have come forward to say, "I want to be involved in advocacy," "I want to be involved in activism," and building relationships on campus and speaking about Israel. And we're looking at like a 300% growth even over last year. Uh, what, so what was that percentage? Like 300% growth. 300% growth. Yeah. Wow. So I wanted so, to make sure I heard you correctly on that. <laughs> like I think last year we we tracked like, you know, we engaged, I don't know, four or 500 students in, in, in sort of real Hasbara type work. Uh, and, and this year it's, you know, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the number is, 1,400, 1,500 students. Wow. Um, and again, you know, as a, as a percentage of all the students on campus, it's a relatively small percentage. But when you look at it in terms of growth and when you look at it in terms of the fact that, that those students who are doing that kind of work are, again, I look at my pyramid, they are the top of the pyramid. Uh, yeah, but now you're talking about 10% of the overall population. If there's 14,000 students, 14,500, 1,500 students is 10%. That's a big chunk of that pie in, exactly. that, in that leadership role. So it becomes significant. and. Um, so, you know, I always come back to this sort of, there is the need. And I even look at my own experience, you know, um, I made the joke to you earlier about, you know, the lack of hair. But when I, when I was a student some, you know, some quite a few years ago at this point, um, I, I'll never forget this. The sort of, you know, I was never interested in, in Israel advocacy. I was never interested in Jewish community. I, I lived a relatively secular life, um, went to public school. 
my first day of university was September 11th, 2001. And I was at York University. That's a transformative day. <laughs> it was, and, and it's, it transformed my entire worldview. And I remember being in a lecture, um, you know, somewhat early on in, 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 in my time at university, a political science lecture, probably with 300 people in the room. And this professor gets up and he says this. He says, anyone can tell when a Palestinian goes into Israel and blows himself up that that's terrorism. But what about when Israel responds with its helicopters and its airplanes and it knocks down buildings and it, and it you know, kills Palestinian women and children? Is that not terrorism, he says to the class. Um, and I don't know what possessed me because I'm a relatively shy guy. I, I'm always the one sort of standing off in the corner and I, and I don't know what to this day what possessed me, uh, but I put up my hand and I said, well, that's not terrorism, but let me ask you a question. Uh, again, this was right after September 11th. I said, I assume you'll agree that the attacks in New York and Washington uh, in Pennsylvania were, were terrorism. And he said, yes. And I said, okay, so the United States and Canada and Britain and a whole bunch of other countries are currently using their helicopters and their planes and they're in Afghanistan. And, and I am sure inadvertently killing um, uh, Afghani women, right? Civilians. Yeah. Yeah. Would you consider that terrorism? And he paused for a second and I'll never forget this. Uh, and, and he says, well, I can see we're not going to agree. So let's take a question from somebody else. Yeah. And for me, that was like this sort of aha moment. And, it, and, and like you said, it, this sort of transformed my worldview. And it was, it was really the thing that got me interested in this work and interested in, in these conversations because it's not rational, right? You're not dealing with facts and with logic, right? You're dealing with this sort of um, emotional uh, knee jerk, uh, at the end of the day, anti-Semitism. And um, in it, the veil uh, of, it, it's, it's anti it's, it's in the veil of anti-Zionism. I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist, but I'm yeah. not anti-French, you know, or, right. you know. Um, exactly right. Uh, there, there's also, you know, th this context of, of, of BDS, right? You know, a lot of people um, might be sympathetic to BDS as a, you know, the boycott, div divestment and sanctions movement, um, but they are unaware that, uh, they're unaware that the third of the three platforms of the BDS movement is, is essentially the destruction of Israel. So it's not about really changing. Well, they call it the right of return, of course. They call it the right of return. But but even the most liberal parties within Israel, yeah. uh, like Meretz, for example, can't accept that because they know that from a demographic perspective, the yeah. unambiguous um, right of return for Palestinians would mean the end of the state of Israel. Um, but there's there also seems to be like, you know, BDS gets a lot of press, but doesn't seem to get a lot of play. Um, especially on the college campus, you you see student governments left and right uh, voting for BDS. You see uh, the academic um, unions and institutions of uh, of professors and uh, uh, and scholars, uh, you know, speaking in terms of uh, favor of BDS. But the universities themselves are not changing their policies. The uh, corporate world is not changing their policies. Um, and, you know, it's also like if you really want to support BDS, put down your cell phone, don't don't take generic drugs, um, you know, stop using computers. Uh, and if you have colon cancer, you know, don't take any uh, treatments for that because all of that comes from Israel. Um, how, how do you understand and how do you help students uh, with BDS? And I'll add to that also the um, the. Uh, uh, Israel is apartheid movement, which I think that Dafka started at York University. Yeah, U of T. Um, uh, at U of T. Um, so how, how do you how do you help students with that, and what what's going on there on campus? So you're right in everything you said about BDS. I mean, it is it, first of all, at the moment, I would say this is largely a campus phenomenon. You know, you don't see the the, the kind of attention uh, in the broader community uh, relative to BDS, at least not at the moment. I mean, we have in the past, and again, it's sort of cyclical, but for the most part, it's largely a campus conversation. Uh, and it's largely a, a, a campus union conversation, you know, in terms of uh, student unions. Uh, there have been some faculty unions who have who have taken up this uh, 
this, this agenda, but it's largely, it's largely a union issue. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the most important things that we can do when it comes to BDS, uh, and, and the student unions is we need friendly, we need friends to get elected. You know, it's, it's super easy to, to sort of be the Monday morning quarterback and stand on the sidelines and, uh, you know, talk and complain and worry. Uh, we need Jewish students. We need moderate non-Jewish students to to get elected. I mean, when you look at the uh, the, the the numbers of um, votes you need to get elected, it is staggeringly low. Uh, but we need students to do it. We, we we need to identify, and it's one of the things that we're doing at Hillel with with, with some of our partners. Um, you know, we're working to find these students again, whether they be Jewish or non-Jewish. We we need moderates uh, to get elected to have a voice. Um, and, and to take a stand against this stuff because, you know, campuses really should not be about, um, it should not be about BDS. It, it should be about student, student issues. And, uh, so that's, you know, that is one very large piece to this because oftentimes by the time the vote comes, uh, it, it's almost too late, right? We, we need, we need to be in the room ahead of time. The other thing I would say is, and, and you alluded to it, you know, in your question, this is almost, an, this is almost exclusively symbolic. Uh, this, this is not a question of, of economics. It's, 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 it's symbolism. It's bad PR, uh, it's spin, uh, but it's not, it, it's not impacting, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, Israel's bottom line, um, or, or really changing the investment uh, practices of, of these unions. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and, and again, you alluded to it in your question, universities across the board uh, are against BDS. They are against negative uh, forms of, of, of divest, uh, they're against all kinds of negative screens on, on their investments. You know, they, they look at ethical investing and, and they try and put in place positive um, policies and practices that will ensure their money is, is investing in, in things that match their, um, uh, their, their values and their morals. Uh, but but no university in Canada uh, is in favor of BDS. And in fact, we at Hillel have tremendous relationships with university administrators across across the province. And my colleagues at Hillel's and other places in Canada have tremendous relationships with their universities as well. And 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 I can tell you, um, these university administrators don't like this stuff any more than we do. Uh, they would love not to fight these issues. They would love not to have. Um, anti-Israel uh, activists, you know, using their university for their propaganda. Uh, could they do more? And 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 do we want them to do more? Absolutely, a hundred percent, we do. Uh, and and we are working with them and encouraging them to do that on, on a on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, but but by and large, university administrators have been uh, ha have been steadfast in in their rejection of of BDS. Um, I have two final questions for you in the time that's remaining. Um, so we'll try to get to them as quickly as we can. Uh, the first is, uh, talk a little bit about the challenge that Jewish students have in terms of allyship with the other um, liberal, court, um, liberal causes that Jews might be concerned about, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, reconciliation, uh, uh, racism, diversity, and uh, inclusion and equity, as you referred to um, earlier, um, and and the challenge of getting into those spaces where um, a um, uh, an anti-Israel uh, sentiment may also be um, present that that forces the Jews to 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 stay out or makes it more difficult for them to come in. It's one of the most pressing issues that we are currently working to deal with, 100%. Uh, and I would say, you know, on your last point, it's not that it's forcing the Jews to stay out, it's forcing them to check their identity at the door, right? So uh, either, either saying, um, I'm not going to talk about Israel, I, I'm not going to talk about Zionism, I, I, right? And so it's, they're leaving pieces of themselves at the door, and that's the problem, right? We need to be in those spaces. We need to be talking about our identity. We need to be talking about ourselves as a marginalized community and, and our history and the challenges that we face as a people. Um, and we have to do it in those spaces. If we can't do it in those spaces, everything else that we're doing uh, eventually becomes irrelevant. We need to find a way um, to, to, to more effectively um, you know, insert our voice, our narrative, 
uh, in those DEI spaces. And it's, again, one of the one of the most pressing things that we're dealing with on campus right now. Um, and I'll say we have a lot of students who are really passionate about this, who are really interested in the, really interested uh, in this area. Uh, and I and I would say it's probably because this next generation is more progressive and more, um, uh, you know, they, they want to build these relationships. They want to talk in progressive spaces. Uh, and so, you know, we we we've really tried to to build a team. Uh, to support those students in those conversations. You know, we've got, we've got a real spectrum of sort of our staff from, you know, their own backgrounds, their own identities, their own politics. Uh, but, but to be able to speak confidently in, in, those, um, in those diverse spaces is 100% key to our work at Hillel, and I would say to the community who's work more broadly. Um, last question, Jay. Um, our audience is, are mostly the parents and grandparents, and probably in some cases, great-grandparents of uh, the students that you and Hillel work with. Um, last word, what do you want us to know? How can we help? We are in desperate need of, of resources always, and I hate to make this a, uh, a, a fundraising pitch, but we know the more students that we can get in front of, the more students that our staff, the more staff that our students can interact with, the more likely they are to continue along this path, to walk this Jewish journey uh, with us, with you, with this community, uh, and we need all the support that we can get. So, any anyone that's interested in speaking with with, with me further, um, with with supporting our work, uh, I'd welcome the opportunity to do that. And you can find Jay at the Hillel Ontario website. Uh, Jay, thanks so much for being with us again. Uh, our condolences to you and to your entire extended family on the loss of your grandmother. Um, this is a conversation, an important conversation. It's not a one-off. Uh, we'll find another way to do this. And uh, we at Betsetic certainly are keen uh, to be partners um, with Hillel on uh, serving the needs of uh, this important uh, part of our Jewish community. Thanks, Thank everyone, so for much. joining us. Uh, don't forget to, to be with us this coming weekend. Uh, tomorrow's Rosh Chodesh Sivan. That means Shavuot is around the corner. We have an exciting program of uh, study and engagement over the course of Shavuot beginning Saturday night to find out all about the offerings of Beth Sedek to live a meaningful Jewish life at www.beth-sedek.org. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Shavuot Tov.